this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial we're going to take a look at creating particles um, represented by pixels that we can plot on our screen. So at the moment I've got this uh, window which just displays a block of colour and slowly cycles through um, different possible colours. Uh, so I'm going to use that later on, I'm going to save that code um, for a while but um, what I want to do now is define a particle class and display those particles on the screen. So let's, let's go to Eclipse and um, let's create a new class here. So I'll right click the project, go to New Class and I'll call this Particle and I'll, I'll keep it in this cave of programming namespace. Um, I I don't know if I'll need a constructor and destructor, but let's let's define them because there's certainly no harm in having them. Let's click finish. Um, I'm also going to define another class here, which I'm going to call Swarm, and Swarm is going to manage a collection of particles. So let's um, again, I'll give it a constructor and destructor. I'll call it Swarm and put it in this cave of programming namespace again. So I've got two new classes here. Now let's go to Particle and let's start thinking about what kind of properties a particle will have. So we're going to define some private instance variables here. And um, I suppose the most fundamental uh, thing about the state of a particle is that it needs an X and Y position on the screen. And now I'm going to make these double, so let's say double, and I'll call this m underscore x, m to say, m underscore to say that it's um, a member variable, just to make that clear, although that's, that's certainly not um, absolutely necessary. And let's have a double m underscore y. Now the reason I'm making them double is because even though on, on the screen, um, we're dealing with individual pixels, so the x and y location are always uh, always integers. I want to be able to change these values gradually and um, then just sort of round them off to the nearest pixel position. So if, if I want to change, for example, the x value gradually by adding some small number to it, like 0 0.01, every time the screen refreshes, of course I can't do that if it's an integer. So although we have to display it, at kind of an integral position at a particular pixel. Its, its position um, may be um, maybe somewhere between two pixels. We just kind of round it off uh, to the nearest pixel when we actually display it. But having a double position allows us to move it conceptually bit by bit. So, and that avoids having to move it by an entire pixel every time we move it. Um, so uh, we, we can achieve uh, more of an illusion of smooth movement. Uh, so we've got um, X and Y. That's that's probably all we really need to to start with. Just an X and Y position for the particle, as far as I can think um, at the moment. Let's go to the particle constructor here, and um, in the constructor. I could initialize the x and y values, really. So yeah, let's let's maybe do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to include standard lib .h, standard lib .h, because I want to use a function called rand, like that, and uh, rand returns a random number between naught and a constant called rand underscore max. So uh, this, this returns an integer, and this is an integer, I believe. So this division would, wouldn't really make any sense. But if I multiply rand by a double, or if I cast it to a double like that, this will then return as a random number between naught and 1. Now, wh what I'd really like to do is um, I'd, I'd like to have the particles kind of move within some um, some virtual space. But I don't want that virtual space to be tied to the screen dimensions. Because then if I change the time that if I change the size of the screen or something, 
then um, the way our, our program works has fundamentally changed. I want to have the particles move around in some space of a fixed size, some mathematical space, and then we'll map that later onto the screen. So I'm going to initialize the exposition of the particle to somewhere between, let's say, arbitrarily, minus 1 to plus 1. So we can imagine that the particle inhabits a plane with uh, Cartesian coordinates, if you've ever done any maths, where um, the x minimum x and y coordinates are both minus 1, and the maximum possible x and y coordinates are both plus 1. And if, if you've never studied Cartesian coordinates, you might want to just have a look at a page on them, you know, just for uh, sort of 10 minutes or something, just to get the idea, but they're, they're relatively simple. So um, if I set, um, th this is going to set x equal from equal to something from 0 to 1, but I want it to be from um, minus 1 to plus 1. So let's, let's firstly maybe work on the range there. So if I multiply rand by 2.0, so now we don't need the Castler double because this bit is, is a double now. Let's, we could put brackets around that just to be doubly short, so to speak. Uh, so this should give us a number in the range 0 to plus 2.0. And if I then subtract 1 from that, I think I'm right in saying that we've now got um, a range of minus 1 to plus 1. So first, firstly, I increase the range there. So that it, instead of being 0 to 1, it was 0 to 2. Then I subtracted 1, which gives us minus 1 to plus 1, if I've if I've got this correct. What's the uh, warning there? Bad character sequence. Sometimes I find this happens, and I think I'm somehow typing um, invisible characters that it doesn't like. I'm not sure how, but yeah, that, that's fixed that. I just had to delete, sort of underline the space there, and I just had to delete it and put the space back in again. Maybe I hit the Alt key by mistake or something, but it doesn't seem to stop it compiling though. Let's let's do the same with um, with y as well. So let's set y equal to some random number from minus 1 to plus 1. So that's our particle covered. Now usually what I'd do is I would um, supply like a get method for x and y, but we're going to have to deal with a lot of particles and we're going to have to get x and y values over and over again every time the screen refreshes for a huge number of particles. So perhaps it's better to simply um, to simply make these values public and access them directly. That breaks encapsulation, but um, we're forced in games and simulations and things like that often to uh, adopt a programming style that's not ideal for the sake of efficiency. So it might be better to make this public. An alternative thing that you, you often see done is instead of explicitly declaring this as public, what we could do is, by default in a class, if I write it like this, these will be private by default. But there's also a thing called a struct in C++. And if I just change this from a class to a struct, the only difference between a class and a struct is that the members are public by default. So um, if I do this, then we know that the intention is to access these directly and that they are now public. So maybe I'll do that. So that's the only difference between a class and a struct. And that's the sort of thing they ask you on interviews as well, is that by default in a class, member variables are private if you don't specify an access modifier. In a struct, they're public by default. And I'm just making them public for the sake of efficiency, although ideally we, we wouldn't do that. So that's my particle covered. Um, I also need to initialize this random number generator because it, I, I think it returns, as far as I know, it returns the same random numbers in sequence every time. And I'd like it to return different ones every time. And we can do that by going, um, for example, to main here and um, if I include here, include standard lib again, standard lib.h in um, using namespace standard, um, I've missed out there, d there. 
then I can call a function here called srand. And uh, srand seeds the random number generator with a number, uh, which makes it produce a different sequence of random numbers every time. And uh, to, for the seed number, because I need to supply it with some number to seed it with, I can use a function called time, which is found in time.h, I think, but it's probably already included because we've got stl.h. There's no harm in including time.h if it exists. It does kind of change its name from uh, implementation to implementation. Uh, let's just check what the error is here. So um, there's something there it doesn't like. I'm just going to check um, the program that I implemented previously in case I've got this slightly wrong somehow. Let's just check where I seeded my time. So somewhere in here I should have seeded my um, random number generator. Oh yes, there we go. Ah yes, so t t the time function takes null. Um, it, it can return the time into a struct that you pass it. If I remember rightly, and this, this might be wrong, so don't take this as gospel, uh, but we don't want it to do that. We just want to, we don't want it to return anything other than um, the number of um, milliseconds, I think it is, since 1974 or, or whatever it is, something like that. To be honest, this is one thing that I've got so used to typing that I've um, stopped wondering what it actually does. Let's, let's close some of these. No, but um, you can certainly Google for that if you're interested. But basically this formula here seeds our random number generator. Okay, so let's, let's leave that um, and go back to our, our program. Okay, I'm going to close everything actually so I don't get confused and open them again here. So that's, that's not even the right program. Here we go. So particle.h. Um, okay, so we've got our particle now. And um, now I want a class that organizes the particles because we're going to have to deal with a massive load of particles. And um, I, I'd like some class that can organize them all. So um, I've got my swarm here that I've created. And uh, I'm going to give this a private member variable here. Let's say that it's, uh, well, if I include here, if I include um, uh, double quotes, because it's a local include file, particle.h, and I'm, I'm, I'm using this Kava programming namespace. And then I can say in here, particle pointer. Let's call this m underscore p particles. Uh, m because it's an instance variable, p because it's a pointer. Then in my constructor here, let's go to swarm.cpp. Um, Probably this is a reasonable place to initialize this. Let's set that equal to new, um, new particle array. And how many particles do we want? Well, I can define a constant. Let's call the constant n particles. And uh, let's go to swarm.h and make that a, I'll make it public just in case we need to use it outside of swarm. Yes, we, we probably will in fact. Let's say n particles and let's make that a const static int and set it equal to some number like um, 5,000. You might want to make this lower if, you're pro if your computer's a bit slow, but if it is, you'll find that out later on. But let's, let's try um, 5,000 to start with. So we're going to have 5,000 different particles. And now we mustn't forget in swarm.cpp, in the destructor here, we have to delete m underscore p particles. And because it's an array, we need these square brackets. So m underscore p particles. So now we've got a load of particles there. So this is this is going to allocate memory and also fill that memory with a bunch of particle objects. And when the particle constructor for each particle runs, it's going to assign a different like random location to itself. 
Now, I, I also want to be able to get particles from my swarm. So I'm going to go to swarm.h here and create a public method which returns a particle pointer and we'll call it, um, I could call it get particles or even just particles. Sometimes it's nice to omit the get, um, but perhaps get particles would be clearer. Let's call it get particles and I'll, I'll actually implement it here in line because it's only going to be a small function so I'll implement it in the header and we'll just say return m underscore p particles. Now we should think about const a bit here. Um, this particles pointer we don't want to point it to anywhere else ever once we've, uh, once we've set it equal to something in our constructor. So why not make it a const pointer? to a particle. And when, when we actually return it, we, we want to make sure that um, the, 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 when we actually get this pointer outside of this class, we want to make sure that it, it can't, the particles that it points at can't be changed. We only want to change them, uh, possibly within this class or within the particle class itself. So let, let's say that this returns a const pointer in other words, a pointer that can't be made to point anywhere else to a particle that's const. So a const pointer to a particle that's const. So the particle can't be changed either using this pointer that's returned. Let's try that. Let's just build this thing um, and see if it builds. So I've got um, an error here. Oh yes, because um, I um, signed this in the in the constructor. Um, maybe I can't really make it const because I, I have to change it at least here. So that, yeah, that's, that's a shame, but I, I don't really see a, a clear way around that. So let's get rid of this const actually. because uh, Sorry, not that one, this one, because otherwise we can't even assign it in the constructor. Okay, let's, let's try this. So I think, I think that looks good. Now let's see if we can actually draw these particles. Um, so let's let's go to main.cpp and uh, in main.cpp I'm going to declare a swarm somewhere here. Uh, let's declare a swarm. Swarm, I'll call it swarm. So that the class has an uppercase S. That's the convention I'm following and I'll make the actual object the same name with a lowercase s. Some people hate this uh, convention but I quite like it. We've only got one swarm here and my classes all have an uppercase letter. So uh, the object can just have a lowercase letter there. Then uh, in, my, in my while loop here, I need to get a pointer to all the particles I want to draw. Before I do that, let's, let's comment out um, some code here. Let's comment out the stuff that displays that um, and puts the colored block on the screen. We're going to use that later, so I'll just comment it out for the moment with a multi-line comment here, slash star star slash, uh, and we'll use it later. Now that should hopefully give us a black screen, and hopefully it shouldn't crash or anything. Um, let's not continue because we've got an error there. So I've got unused variable elapsed, but that's, um, that's just a warning. We can include that in the comment. We've also got a error on no time unknown type swarm and that's just because I got I forgot the header. So let's include here swarm.h. And let's try building it again, see if it builds this time. Whoops, build project. And yeah, it looks it looks fine now. Let's run it. And we, we get a nice black screen. Okay. So now let's see if we can plot that collection of particles with their random positions. So they won't move at the moment. We, we can maybe do that in the next tutorial. Quite exciting. But we can at least plot them so we have something that looks like, um, sort of like stars. So what we need to do is uh, we need to loop through all the particles. Let's say for int i equals naught, i less than swarm colon colon n particles, that's the number of particles, i plus plus. Uh, before we do that actually we need to say uh, particle, well it's actually const particle pointer 
const. So reading this backwards, const pointer to a particle that's const. Um, call this, let's call this p particles equals swarm dot get particles. Uh, don't use the class name here by mistake. We need the, the object that we created there. We need to put the, that semicolon in the right place. Then we can we can get each particle. So we can say particle particle particle, let's call it, equals um, p particles brackets i. We could call that p particle to emphasize it's a pointer, um, but um, I'll just call it particle, I think. So we've got, we're getting the individual particles one by one, and now we need to just plot them on the screen using that position. How can we do that? Well, we're going to have to map the particle space, um, which goes from minus one to plus one on both x and y, to the actual screen space. So if we get, um, let, let's say, ent. Uh, let's call this x equals particle dot x. Now, what, what do we have to do to x, the particle x from minus 1 to plus 1, to map it to a location on the screen? Well, the first thing is we, we don't want it to be negative, so let's add 1 to it, um, because that will make it range. Instead of from minus 1 to plus 1, now it'll be from 0 to 2. Uh, and let's, let's surround that with brackets. And then if we multiply this by, um, so if it's ranging from 0 to 2, if we, if we multiply it by half of the width of the screen, it's going to range from 0 to the screen width. It has to be half because we're going from 0 to 2. Uh, so if we multiply 2 by half of the screen width, we get the screen width. So let's try this. Let's say multiply it by... Um, I think we can use the constant from screen, screen width. I I think that that should that should work. Um, yeah. So we 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 add. Oh yes, it's actually not x, but m underscore x. So we add add one so that the x is from naught to two, and multiply by the screen width. I think they should do the trick. The, the disadvantage of this actually would be that um, position naught for the particle. So naught plus one would be yeah, multiplied by half the screen width. Sorry, if if the position is at particle naught, we'd like that to be in the centre of the screen. But does that actually work? So um, the x position of the particle is naught. Add one, it's one. Multiply it by half the screen width. Yes, I, th I think it actually does work. I think this might actually work. <laughs> let's let's try it. Let's let's also get y in the same way. So int y y equals particle dot m underscore y plus plus one to make it go from naught to two instead of minus one to plus one. Multiply it by half of the screen height. So screen height divided by oops screen height divided by divided by two, and then hopefully we'll, you'll have the, we'll have the y ranging from naught up to the screen height. Now one question in my mind is here: um, Could the if if, if the particles actually actually at one? then isn't it going to end up actually at um, the screen width? If the screen width is 600, it's going to be actually at 600. We don't, we don't want that because that's actually off the screen because um, the, the pixels in the screen start numbering at zero. So if, if you go up to um, screen width, let's say, then it's actually off the screen. But for, for our purposes here, um, it doesn't matter too much because we've implemented set pixel function in screen.cpp which actually checks let's see set pixel is in here oh yes we, we haven't actually done any checking but we could make this check and make sure that it doesn't plot a pixel that's off the edges of the screen um, I, I think this wouldn't plot pixels off the edges of the screen because um, 
rand divided by rand max would have to actually return one for that to happen. Well, yes, that probably could happen, actually. Let's take care of this problem uh, rather than uh, agonizing over the exact possible pixel values of particles. Let's simply make set pixel refuse to plot a pixel off the edge of the screen. So we can put a check here. This is in screen.cpp in set pixel. Let's say if x is less than naught or x is um, greater than or equal to um, screen width or y is less than naught or y is greater than or equal to screen height then instead of plotting a pixel we'll just return like that so we'll only plot a pixel if it's within naught screen width minus one including screen width minus one or y is y, uh, y also has to be um, greater than naught and it has to be less than screen height so I think I think that's good now this this is inefficient if you if you really needed to squeeze a lot of processing power out of your computer then you would uh, maybe want to think more carefully about exactly what you were plotting on the screen and possibly not do this but um, this used to be something that people bothered about more in the early days of games programming when computers really struggled to produce uh, anything that looked good at all. Um, but now it's, it's a lot more common to have some kind of clipping, as we call it, on the screen, just to make sure that if you try to plot something over the edge of the screen, um, that it just it won't plot. Because otherwise, if we didn't do something like this, plotting a pixel off the edge of the screen could easily crash your program. So although this is very inefficient, checking this for every single pixel that we plot um, maybe uh, it's, it's not a bad idea here. I think our program will probably still run fast enough. Well, I, I know it will on this computer. And it saves us having to really agonize about the exact values of pixels that we're plotting. So um, let's, let's go back now to main.cpp. So now we've calculated the positions of the particles. They might be slightly off the edge of the screen, one pixel off the edge, but we don't have to worry about that anymore. Now we can use screen dot set pixel and we can put the x and y positions in there and for the colors for the moment let's um, well we could use these rather nice colors that we've calculated here let's just make them white for the moment though to maximum 255 for red green and blue so that it's easy to see them and let's finally run this and see if it works here's the moment of truth and then indeed it works and we've got a sort of star field uh, it doesn't really look like a star field, it's a bit ugly, but we're going to make it look a, a lot nicer later on. One last little thing that we could do here, which might be nice, would be to uncomment these colours, get rid of the stuff that draws, uh, that fills in the entire screen here, and move this above where we're plotting the particles, format the code, and then use those colours to red, green, and blue to draw the pixels. Let's try this and see how this looks. So it's not gonna look very pretty, but you can see we've got a load of stars if you've got a good imagination. And you might be able to tell uh, from this video that they are in fact slowly changing color. Okay, so that's it for this tutorial, very long tutorial. Uh, but I wanted to get to the point where you could actually see something new. In the next tutorial, what we're going to do is we're going to animate these particles uh, so even more exciting, and we're going to get them moving around the screen. So until next time, happy coding.